a shift. A lot of times I've tried to take people to the Arctic, I've tried to take people to places that I feel like are, are really pushing the level of not only the photographer, but the equipment. And I'm gonna be sharing a bit about my passion for aerial photography today. One of the things you'll realize is that we're always trying to push the envelope, right? We're not only trying to push the equipment, but we're trying to see just how far we're willing to go to tell a story. And with this body of work, it's really been about not only trying to understand you know, how you can compose and create awareness around these places, but also who are these people that can get you to these amazing locations. Over the last couple of years, I've been able to photograph a lot of Iceland's most remote regions by plane. Usually one of my favorite things about that is actually trying to apply some sense of subject to this landscape because as you know, being in the air thousands of feet above the ground, it can be really hard to have some sense of scale, some sense of where I am. This is a bush plane pilot flying a small Piper Cub over one of the pseudo craters in the middle of Iceland. It's taken me pretty much everywhere around the world. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to work on aerial photography as more of a personal project. It's not the commercial work, it's not the editorial work that's usually paying the bills. It's kind of this passion-driven thing that allows me to connect with pilots, allows me to connect with the landscape in a really super unique way. But as many of you guys know, if there's one way to kind of sum up the challenge of what it's like to stick yourself out of a plane or open the door, you probably can relate to this next slide a little bit. This is kind of what it feels like in many ways, you know? Um, you're not just pushing the controllers on a drone, you're actually up there, you're opening the door, you're shoving your camera out of a 180 mile per hour plane or helicopter, and you're feeling every little bit Sometimes the water wells up in the corner of your eyes and you feel like you're crying. Sometimes your fingers go completely numb, right? And in that experience, you're hoping to in some way create a really unique image. There are three things that I'm gonna to address today that have absolutely changed the game in terms of creating beautiful aerial photography. Battery life, high frame rate, and probably the most important thing is in-camera stabilization. This is my good friend, Chris Berdeen. He's a pilot based out of Taos, New Mexico. And Chris's story was really one of the most important things I wanted to bring to the table. When Sony released the A7R 3 they asked me, what, what is a story you want to tell? And I was like, there's a guy who built a plane in his garage and it's called an ultralight trike, okay? This thing is basically, it's a motorcycle with a wing above it, all right? totally exposed, totally open, no windshield, nothing. And he built the entire thing by hand in his garage. These are the types of stories that I wanted to bring to the table. Now, normally to, to truly document something like this in high quality, you would need a lot of camera equipment, a lot of gear, a lot of heavy gear. We didn't have that opportunity. This plane weighs maybe a couple hundred pounds max. So we're trying to document this experience using the lightest weight most powerful equipment possible. And that's exactly what we did. The setting to create this short film was in the Great Sand Dunes of Colorado, Great Sand Dunes National Park. You're surrounded on every corner by 14,000 foot peaks, the Sangro de Cristo Mountains. This is a place that Chris has been flying for the majority of his career, right? A place that by a lot of standards might seem almost otherworldly. Now battery life, first thing. I will be the first person to tell you that some of the earlier versions of the A7, A7S, the battery life was one of its absolute worst points. Trying to photograph the Northern Lights with the A7S with a tiny battery was painful. We would keep the batteries in coolers. We were having to keep them with hand warmers wrapped around them. We were keeping them in sometimes insulated sleeves, right? The battery life on the A7R 3 is four to five times better. So much so that on these freezing cold mornings, it'd be 15 degrees Fahrenheit when we'd wake up and we're having to de-ice the whole plane. We went to U-Haul to rent towels, blankets, whatever, to put on top of the wing so that ice wouldn't collect overnight so we could fly. That being said, we're putting the cameras in exposed places on the wing of the airplane. This is the angle you get when you attach a wide angle lens 
with the A7R 3 from the wing. Now that camera is being exposed to everything. We're flying at about 80 to 90 miles per hour, dealing with sub-zero temperatures, and this thing is hanging on by one thread, right? Literally, one tiny bottom thread. The battery life was lasting for two to three hours at a time. Absolutely unreal. I'm gonna show you a time lapse later that really dives into this. Sensor stabilization. Now, if there's one thing that I, I uh, there was a speaker before, Nino, one of, the, one of the great Sony artisans, he said, one thing that people are realizing is that it's about dynamic range, not megapixels. The real conversation at the trade show when it comes to mirrorless cameras is about dynamic range. That's all we really care about. The second most important thing that you should be considering is in-camera stabilization. Five axis stabilization. So when you're shooting a photograph like this or filming handheld from a plane with no windows, I'm dealing with the brunt of every vibration, every piece of wind. And this sensor, not the lens, is stabilized. That has been an absolutely game-changing thing for filmmaking, for photographing subjects moving fast when the light is very low. And I'm talking about shooting at a 60th of a second, a 30th of a second, for, with a compressed lens from a moving subject, of moving subjects. We're moving at about 90 miles per hour. They're moving at about 90 miles per hour. We're gliding across this landscape. It's not smooth at all. The in-camera stabilization is the only thing that is allowing us to create images like this. Again, a perspective that we're able to gather from the top looking down. You can see Chris, he's basically pulling his hands out of these mittens he has on the controls. He has other gloves on. He's taking his A7R 3 and he's photographing from the front of the plane, or from the front of the trike, I guess you could call it. Um, this, is, this is forcing him to deal with every single amount of wind and bump that's coming at him, right? And the camera's still staying solid. This gives you a good perspective. So in the front of this plane, what kind of looks like some weird little device, that's actually our gyro, a little tiny stabilized device. And the A7R 3 is basically just mounted with a tiny little thing underneath. Chris, again, basically filming handheld out of the plane. Um, using a wide angle and the A7R 3 with the battery pack. A lot of times there's a, there's a funny concept when it comes to professional photography, people think that it's all about having the perfect setup, the most dialed scenario, but the word MacGyver and Jimmy Rig totally comes to mind every time I've ever done a shoot anywhere. Things like masking tape, things like you know having to wrap your camera strap around something to make it work. These are aspects that we apply to almost everything we're doing, right? It's not always about having perfect conditions, it's about making it work in, the, in, in whatever conditions you're really given. Another one of the unsung heroes from this project that I'm about to share with you is the Sony Action Cam. Lightweight, 4K, something we mounted from almost every perspective in the plane to give us some sense of overhead or top-down view. It was also a camera that if for some reason something happened and it happened to fall off, we weren't too worried about losing it. Um, this gives you a perspective right now. Here's Renan Ozturk. If you notice, these guys are wearing these really thick puffy jackets. Why do you think that is? These are Everest jackets. Both of these jackets have stood on the top of Everest. That gives you a sense of how cold it gets. This plane has four A7R3s mounted to it. One on the wing, one in Renan's hands, one in Chris's hands, and one on the front of the plane. And this is how we were able to create this film. And you're noticing that only one of these has some sort of stabilized unit. Every other camera is shot handheld. You are not gonna find another camera in this show that will be able to deliver that type of performance with that type of dynamic range, right? When you watch this film and you're able to see all this footage created with it, it's, it's pretty mind blowing. One of my favorite perspectives, really giving you that top down angle. There's Chris with one hand shooting. Now, another thing I love to kind of educate people on is when you're shooting mirrorless, one of the beauties is you rarely have to put your eye up to the viewfinder. Chris is wearing a big thick helmet. He can't simply lift that mask up and put his eye to the viewfinder. So we're constantly relying on the screen. We're constantly relying on the ability for us to kind of hold the camera strap, make that camera strap rigid, and basically photograph there. And this gives you a perspective for what it's like to shoot a high burst rate or a time lapse from the wing with the A7R 3 
You can see we're following another trike through the sand dunes, right? All these high-res raw files. Now, moving through this landscape is probably one of my favorite things, just being able to see the different perspectives, the different shapes, and really be able to put this together in some sort of motion aspect, right? A high frame rate, probably kind of the, the last and maybe one of the most important things when it comes to a full frame camera, especially one that is optimized for high resolution. Um, in my camera bag at all times, doesn't matter if I'm shooting for Apple or Microsoft or an editorial assignment, the a7R 3 is the one camera I have chosen to use for 99.9% .9 of assignments. And because of the fact that it can shoot 11 frames a second, that was really what allowed me the opportunity to make this camera my mainstay. Um, when you're tracking subjects that are moving in a landscape that actually doesn't have that high of contrast, it, it, it really puts the ability to focus to the test. This is one of those scenarios where you're having to track, you're moving, you have wind hitting the camera, and at all times, you're trying to hope that you can capture this image in focus. There's a word that comes to mind, and a lot of times we use it in photography. It's called spraying and praying, right? Where you're, you're just shooting a burst, and you're hoping that one of those is gonna work. And in this scenario, this is one of those places where I would say it's totally acceptable, right? You're getting literally split seconds where you're able to see a perspective like this because we're constantly having to move with the wind, right? This is an evening shot at the dunes overlooking the entire landscape. Again, 14,000 foot peaks all around, late afternoon sun, very high contrast scenario where I wanna use those 14 stops dynamic range. I think it's actually 15, sorry, to bring out the shadows, to pull back the highlights. I don't always have the opportunity to have a perfectly exposed image. I'll be the first person to tell you that. For me, it's more about creating something that has an emotional connection to where I am and being able to tell a story than walking away with a perfectly exposed image, right? Now I wanna share with you this film. It's about Chris, it's about his passion for landscapes, it's about his passion for flying and how he's been able to cultivate and bring all this together to create a way to see the world that I think most of us aspire to do. dreams my whole childhood of flying above the earth, imagining what it would be like up there. First time I actually flew in a small plane, I was 13. We were in a little metal box, Could, couldn't see that well out the window. I was a little bit uneasy. I figured, well, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Well, the Colorado Great Sand Dunes are this massive body of sand that's deposited right at the foot of a big range of mountains. Dude, look oh at that! My God! Yeah, I was tripping when I was seeing that stuff. Oh my God! Look at the shot. That was after sunset. Wow! Still got illuminated. Nice. I didn't really follow the route of getting a normal job. The importance was do what you love. I took up skiing when I was about 19. My passion kind of led me that direction where I, I wanted to be immersed and connected to everything through what I was doing. In 1999, I actually had a uh, near-death experience skiing where I got pushed off of a cliff. And that was it when I saw where I was going. It was probably a 40-foot drop. I just remember thinking, Shh, that's it, I'm dead. 
When I came to, I was at the bottom of the cliff sitting in snow up to my chin. I fractured my spine and fractured my wrist. And I realized that I wasn't invincible and that any moment could be my last. I began to see the world in a much bigger, all-inclusive way. And I felt like it was time to follow a deeper calling. We're uh, dealing with some freezing temps, shooting Chris, the pilot, in one of his favorite places, and uh, it's been pretty surreal. Last time I snotted so much, I thought I broke the radio. But... <laughs> Welcome to my backyard. <laughs> okay. Can you plug in Renan's radio? Perfect, we got it. Let me, uh, turn it still lingered in my mind and I saw hang gliders and paragliders and I knew I wanted to do something open. and I started seeing trikes, which is basically like a flying motorcycle and anything else. So yeah, it was perfect match for what I wanted to do. When it's smooth, you can take your hands off the controls and relax and just take in the scenery. It's really a, an amazing feeling. Flying has expanded my awareness in huge ways that I'm just starting to realize. This is all one huge being that all relies and connects to each other and works in relationship to each other to sustain life on this planet. I had dabbled in photography, but this sparked that creative side and I wanted to share the feeling of being up there with people. I felt like I was so called to do it. What I would like to continue doing is reaching more people with these images of the earth and inspiring them to have hope that even in the midst of the chaos that we're in, we can let this beauty and natural world inspire us to move towards a sustainable future. Now, sharing Chris's story in many ways to me is it's it's really goes beyond this idea of uh, trying to trying to kind of sell you on this idea that technology is really going to help you tell a better story. It's not the truth. The reality is you can tell a story in any capacity, you know, even with a phone in your hand. But a good piece of technology allows us to step outside of the safe and the routine and the familiar and the known and, and really embrace uncertainty. And that's exactly what he's chosen to do, and I, I, I'm grateful in many ways to the brand, not only for being able to share stories like this, but being able to commit themselves to making technology that allows us to go deeper, to push further, and to try to create something different. And that's really what this show, this experience, and this technology should be about, you guys. And I'm just thank you so much for coming out today.